Welcome back to TactCast, a production of the Tennessee Academy of Christian Thought. Last time, as I recall, we just said there are these problems with interpretation of uh, Paul's interpretation of the Old Testament. And um, we talked a little bit about the historical critical method, if I remember right, and how that doesn't seem, doesn't seem like Paul does that. Right. Um, and what this Hayes guy says is that we should use this intertextual approach and look at it as a as an intertextual approach, and that that basically and that's kind of where we stopped, if I remember right. Yeah, we didn't, we, we we didn't really say didn't. what it was or anything. Yeah, we didn't really get into much of anything. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And then and then he talks. So in the first chapter, he uses what is it Philippians. Um, I should give you the book since this is your book and I left mine at home. <laughs> Philippians one nineteen. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. The intertextual echo in Philippians one nineteen. Yeah. Kind of the, uh, yeah. So this is, is did Paul um, sort of purposely echo Job thirteen sixteen in this? Yeah, that's right. So even this will turn out for my deliverance. Right. Since he's uh, a prisoner, etc. Um, and then he talks about the difference between illusion and echo. Yeah, uh, I just what 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 exactly does he say about the difference between illusion is a conscious thing, right? I'm a I'm a, I'm consciously alluding to it. Correct. Echo is um, maybe we should do this on camera. I don't know. But we are doing this on camera. Oh, we are. Yeah, that's. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's you're why, recording that's this. That's why. That's why I actually got you. Uh, oh. Got you talking a little more natural this. Yeah, way. exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. well, uh, that's fine. So, echo then is not a conscious effort. It's just because the scripture is so, or the other text. But in this case, Paul is using uh, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Right. Um, is using that. I mean, that's so. In <laughs> now that I it's, know we're being recorded, <laughs> um, see it was uh, uh, I kind of did that on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and I was I was kind of pushing these sort of leading questions. Yeah, I, get, I talk get, about it. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. So the scripture is so infused in Paul's in Paul's mind that it uh, he just references these references these ideas and these passages these sections. Um, without intending to make uh, an, an intentional comparison. It just comes out. And so what Hayes says is we see an example of that possibly in Philippians one nineteen, where he's referring back to Job because uh, Paul is a prisoner and, um, and just as a righteous Job is suffering and it will all work out, um, so too Paul will. And there's a place where he very consciously basically echoes yeah job thirteen eighteen. behold i'm near to my judgment i know that i shall appear as righteous and it seems that that paul is echoing borrow is the phrase from job um, yeah to show you know yeah in these bad circumstances i know it's all going to work out basically <clears throat> yeah. so yeah so his point is that in that case it seems likely that paul is not intentionally alluding to the scripture, but it just comes out. And then we're, we need to look for that in other areas where Paul is referencing scripture. So um, I thought about, so the, the I think the idea behind this was, he, he specifically chose this passage because it's, it's, it's an echo. It's not explicitly, right. he's not like saying, Job said this, right. blah, blah, blah. It's, it's, it's not even it's, clear that Paul... Meant to ha- do it. Yeah, meant to right. do it. Right. Yeah, so that's what I find um, most interesting because I think it's it's very clear that Paul is um, it, it, he's very learned. You know, he's, yeah. he's, he's studied this stuff probably his whole life. He's been experiencing it, and his exactly. audience is, of yep. course, Jewish. Yep. So they're going to know. I mean, I think this is a, something we have to really think about is, like, our culture is so different. So, like, mm. in our culture— it's like movie quotes, right? So, like, if I say "I'll be back," right? Well, right. we know exactly what that exactly refers to. everybody exactly. catches that right. reference. Um, <laughs> and I think you know these these 
first century Jews who've been studying Tanakh Torah their whole life, right. when you come up with this, you know, a little blurb, yeah. um, they immediately get the context. Yeah. Um, and, and you can kind of do it without even thinking about it. And right. I think that's kind of what happens a lot with Paul. And I, uh, so I think the, the intertextuality comes through here where b- because it's an echo, it's not a conscious illusion. This, the usage of the scripture may not exactly fit the original meaning. Right. Right. So it's kind of like you just said, I'll be back. Right. Right. If you're leaving the room to go down to the restroom or whatever and you say, I'll be back, you're not going to come crashing through here in a vehicle. (laughs) Right. Right. You're just referencing this Schwarzenegger movie. And right. and it just rings, you know, rings a bell and it's humorous and whatever. Right. And, and that's the sort of thing. So so the scripture that Paul's u- using, he may not be using it referencing exactly what the original meaning was. Right. Um, so I know we're not getting into chapter two yet, but yeah. this will um, we're going to see this throughout, you know, discussing this book. Right. Where you have these ideas that Paul is maybe misreading yeah. scripture but it's not so what Hayes is doing is he's kind of arguing that that Paul's not really misreading the scripture it's that he's using this sort of phraseology or yeah. whatever because yeah. it, it does kind of you know it links back to the text to sort of attach the Jewishness to it yeah um, and the background and the authority behind what he's saying um, but the complete scenario of what's going on at the time at the, you know he's he's kind of using the phrase to fit what he's talking about right. he doesn't mean the whole situation is the same so it's it's it looks like he's misreading the text right but that's not exactly the uh intention i guess yeah yeah, yeah. you know it's funny because as i was reading this i was thinking you know you see this all the time in you know medieval monks or clerics when they're writing they reference scripture all over the place right. and it's sort of these echoes um, and it's the same sort of idea they're not necessarily referring to exactly what the original meaning was but yeah <clears throat> um, so I wrote down uh, some of the big issues and questions yeah. um, tied to this Philippians 119 pass so um, he sort of asked did Paul intend to echo job 13:16? If so, um, how much of that interpretation, uh, of the interpretation that Hayes gives um, to the Paul Job trope was actually in Paul's mind? Mm-hmm. So how much would the Philippians have grasped? Um, how much of it is this sort of, uh, how much is Hayes' own kind of metaphorical fancy? Right, uh, right. <clears throat> but... And then he asks, uh, does the legitimacy of my reading depend on correspondence of uh, to Paul's intention? Um, who has ears to hear the echoes and construe their significance? Yeah. Um, and then what criteria might help us address such situations? And yeah. He comes up with some of his own criteria for the seven, detection. Right? Seven tests. Yeah. Um, and he has like he th- he has five possibilities about intertextuality, and then he has seven tests of hearing yeah. echoes. Yeah. I know you don't like lists very much. I don't. Yeah, yeah not yeah. really. Um, but but I mean, it's it's helpful. Um, yeah. So his five, <clears throat> excuse me, five different mm, approaches, I suppose. One of them was, uh, and I don't have them written down, but what I recall. So correct me if 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 I don't remember correctly, but. <clears throat> What I recall is one of them is sort of, uh, uh, you know, did Paul intend to do this, right? Did the audience pick up on it? Or is this all just in the text? Is it just me getting it from the text? Is it just in the text itself, which seems remarkably sort of uh, uh, postmodern, you know, the text only. And he doesn't say it's one or the other. It's maybe bits of each yeah so i I wrote down the five okay um so the hermeneutic so one possibility is the hermeneutical event occurs in paul's mind right um so his intertextual meanings are valid where they are credibly demonstrated yeah um the second what that would mean is we would have to credibly demonstrate that this clearly refers to this earlier text right okay 
yeah um well and that it's uh, that it's it's very clearly in paul's mind intentionally yeah that's so um the second is that it's in the minds of the philippians right um, and I think you kind of have to do sort of the same thing. How are you going to do that? Yeah, it's, it's a, <laughs> I, I, yeah, you got to prove that. It's very, very difficult, I yeah. think. Um, then you have within the text itself, mm-hmm. um, which you, you talked about, but um, it, that's when we don't have access to the author or the audience, right. um, which, of course, in all of these writings, we don't have access to the author or right, the audience. Right. Uh, in any is, historical writing. Right. Uh, right. Um, and then... The other possibility is this intertextuality happens in his own mind, Hayes's own yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah, the, the reader's mind. Yeah, the reader's mind. Yeah. Um, and then the last is uh, by communities of interpretation. Uh, yeah. So like that, the church. Right. Um, or something like that. Um, so Hayes, uh, as you said, he does not choose one of the possibilities. Um, he says there are sort of problems with all of them in isolation. I tend to favor a couple. I'm curious to see what you think about it. Yeah. Um, well, I have, uh, I, of course, I think it's very difficult to say what's going on in somebody else's mind. Right. Um, uh, nearly impossible unless they, like, unless it's specifically unless stated, yeah. stated, like, right. you know, there's very clear examples where Paul says, uh, you know, like, Abraham said this, yeah. or something like that, and he's he's it's like explicit. He, he definitely has a scripture in mind, right? Yeah, um, and sometimes he'll he'll specifically say what the scripture is, and right. I think in those cases you you kind of know where his where his mind, where his argument, what he's what he's saying. I think it's very clear, but when the, when it's these echoes, yeah, um, yeah, I don't think it's it's very clear whether he fully intends to do it. Or if it's kind of like how we would use movie quotes. Right. So here's the thing that we have to keep in mind as well, I think. I, I would be surprised if uh, the whole of the Hebrew Bible, well, or in this case, Septuagint, was sitting right there in Paul's lap as he's writing, right? It's not like <laughs> it's not like you just pull up your phone and, you know, oh, what was that scripture? You look it up, right? Yeah. It's just, it's all up in here because he's so familiar with it. And when he's writing or dictating, right, it just comes out. Dude, so uh, I had this interesting conversation the other day um, with uh, my the high school guys that I lead at, at church. Uh-huh. Um, man, we we got to talking about a guy named Gary V. Have you heard of Gary V? Uh-huh. So Gary V is this kind of famous rich guy on tiktok and okay. and these other social media platforms which and, would explain why i don't hear about him yeah right well he's <laughs> this guy's all about making money okay. getting the hustle all right you got to get out there and go to uh f- flea markets and and garage sales and you buy stuff for pennies on the dollar and then you just look up the stuff on your phone well we got to talking about just kind of uh how sort of education has changed things like mm-hmm. that um and they talked about, you know, we have the, like these phones at our fingertips. We can just look stuff up at any point in time. That you don't have to memorize anything anymore. Right. Well, Gary V had his TikTok recently where he's saying tests based on memory are just stupid. Mm-hmm. We need to get rid of them all. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, I mean, I really think this is something problematic. Like, mm-hmm. we don't really have to memorize anything anymore right and well we don't yeah like we tend to like some things obviously we can commit to memory but um and i've had to memorize a lot of things you know growing up that was whole like part of my upbringing was having to memorize things right. and read it from a book because four score and seven years ago yeah i didn't have a uh, continent yeah. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> uh but um it, it's like the kids today don't have to memorize. Yeah. Um, well, and but see, I think the thing is, I don't think that what Paul's doing here is sitting down and consciously memorizing. Well, I see, think, I don't either. I but, think he's just so imbued with the Scripture, reading it so often. It's just in there. Well, so that's what I was getting at okay. is like, in the first century, this essentially 
was a lot of what you would do. Yeah. Sit back and, like, if you're a Jewish person, part of the sort of Jewish upbringing tradition is you are um, totally just, I mean, immersed right. in this If you're religiously culture. minded, yeah. Sure. Right, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's this is something that he was completely familiar with. A right. lot of things were just stuck in his mind right. so that he could just instantly recall um, right. without even meaning to, I think, because yeah. it's just the way that he was. It's just, just like my medieval monks, you know, the scripture yeah. just comes because they're so familiar with it, so right. exposed to it. Yeah. yeah. And so in today, we don't really have that outside of like well, movie And culture. there you go. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah, it's movies and TV shows and whatever. Yeah. yeah. And back then, of course, it's, you know, books writings plays or memes even so yeah. like my kids are constantly quoting memes to each other <laughs> yeah uh. so i guess that's it that's the point right that's what he's saying that that paul is not necessarily not always maybe even not mostly when a scripture appears looking at it and quoting it from context it's just an echo yeah, um, no, exactly. I think and that's right. That's an appropriate way to use the scripture. He's using it in that manner, I guess, would be what the point from our standpoint would be. Yeah, no, I agree completely. And so um, then I guess the next chapter is a biggie where he looks at this in Romans, right? Right. Uh, yeah, it's almost like, uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of read like. Ch- it was like I mean, it's almost like a whole commentary yeah, on Romans. I mean, it's You're like right. literally it almost chapter by chapter, yep. Yep. Um, and dealing with the different echoes and, and quotes and everything else. Yep. It's a big one. Um, but before we we um, finish up, I do want to uh, ask you. Like, I know you hate lists, so yeah. <laughs> his seven tests of hearing echoes. I want to. I'd love to hear your thoughts on those. Did you write those down? I did. Yeah, I've got yeah, them yeah. here. Um, availability. That's the first one. How was the earlier text available to the author? I mean, uh, and that kind of references what I was talked about before. We got to be sure that I don't think it's you know it's not like paul's carrying around this huge septuagint with him all everywhere right but he clearly has access to it right um, and knows it um volume and how strong is the correlation between words and syntactical patterns between the two texts yeah so those are the two i mean if you if you've got those obviously the the scripture the septuagint is available to paul um but if you've got some sort of uh very close and tactical and vocabulary mimicry going on there. I think you've clearly got an echo, huh? If not, if not a direct allusion. Um, so that makes sense to me. Recurrence. How often does the author refer to the earlier text and his other writings? I mean, I guess that would just show, it would just sort of confirm availability and uh, familiarity with the text. So uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Thematic coherence. Does the earlier text illuminate Paul's argument? Now, that's going to be an interesting one because, uh, um, you know, as uh, the author of Peter says, Paul's writings are not always easy to understand. <clears throat> historical plausibility. Would his readers, given their historical context, have understood Paul's use of their earlier text? Um yeah, that's going to be a hard one. Uh, I think uh, clearly if they're a Jewish audience, Hellenistic, Greek, mm-hmm. Jew- Jews, that seems very likely, right? History of interpretation, have earlier interpreters viewed the reference? Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, that's an interesting and important, but I don't. it's not determinative, right? Whether sure. or not we're looking to do with an echo, I think. And uh, satisfaction, does the reference itself make sense? I mean, that's clearly, I think. To me, the first one is availability and volume, right? How closely does it resemble the original text? That would be the volume. Yeah. Um, that we're clearly dealing with that. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, just kind of tie this into an example from today, I guess. You could say, like... Um, Life is like a box of chocolates. Yeah, uh, you never know what you're gonna get. Well, clearly, most people are gonna know that reference. Yeah, and if I say it with the same sort of um, 
cadence, right. exact well, words. Just like a box of chocolates. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Right. right. Um, so, I, I, and it's it's very clear that I would be referencing that right. that movie line. Right. So uh, there the volume is, because it's an exact quote, right? Exactly. The volume yeah. is very high. Um, would you be familiar with it? Sure. If you're 16... Would you be familiar with that film? Mm, yeah, it's probably possible, not. but sixteen maybe. Yeah, but like these ten, eleven, twelve year olds. No, for sure not. Yeah, probably not. Um, so, in fact, I bet. Um, gosh, they probably might not even get the "I'll be back" anymore. No, I doubt and it. When was the last Terminator movie? I don't even remember. Was, yeah, I don't know. Um, but but uh, if you said something, so the volume would be slightly less. If you said, if you didn't use the, first of all, the accent, right? The highest volume possibly would be verbatim quote with the, that accent. Life is like a box of chocolates like that. Mm -hmm. But if you said something like, um, you know, life is like chocolate, you know, you never know what you're going to get or something like that. It's not exact. Like, so I could say like the life less. is like chocolate. Some's dark, some's milky. Some's oh yeah, that's really good. I mean, yeah, so yeah. I could, I could totally like there. It's gonna be. It's gonna be a question then. It's yeah. close, right? Have you seen the film or not? No, it was my original idea. Right. So this no, is definitely this not. It was from the well. It was from well the right. Movie. But this is <laughs> this is where somebody would say mm, it's an echo. It's possibly an echo because right. it's super close. Yeah. But the idea is super but the close. Volume, chocolates. The volume is a lot lower. Yeah. Right, right. So it's, it's a lot more difficult to say. Yeah. But if you had, in an earlier podcast, let's say, uh, which would be hard since this is number two, in an earlier podcast, <laughs> you had mentioned seeing that film, then we would know the availability. You had seen that film. And then we could say, even though the volume is low on that echo, almost certainly you're referring to the film because we know you've seen it. Right. Right. So um, that's where you get where um, you have a scripture. I mean, Paul is clearly familiar, having been a Pharisee, mm -hmm. with the Septuagint. Um, and so if if the volume is low, I think the fact that the availability is there um, would increase the chance of it being echo even much more, right? Yeah, so I um, to finish this up is yeah. uh, definitely going a little longer than I think they did. Ah, but it was good. I like the chocolate stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I wrote down, I, I, I put this in italics, which means I thought it was really important because that's <laughs> what I do in my notes. So I say, uh, it, it's, text can generate readings that transcend both the conscious intention of the author and the hermeneutical strictures that we promulgate. Poets and preachers know this, yeah. while biblical critics seek to suppress it. Oh, that's really good. Hayes said that? I think so. I mean, I wrote it down. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, no, I liked it too. That's, okay, real, I thought it was really real important. Because we're running out of time. Yeah. What does that mean in everyday language? Yeah, so when something is written, like, it sort of becomes its own thing. Like, you don't really have access to the author, especially if the author's dead. Right. You don't have access to the author anymore. Right. And you always have, like, these multiple lenses. You got the lens of the author who's trying to convey his meaning behind a text. Mm -hmm. But then you have the reader who has their own lens by which they're viewing a text. Yeah. So, you know, we know, of course, that, like, Paul, for example, you know, Paul is, is, is um, of course, very familiar with the Septuagint, and we can see these sorts of echoes. But um, that we only have the text. We don't have Paul. Right. So we can only really kind of speculate whether he fully intended to right. get the whole, you know, you know, yeah, and yeah. so so what he's saying in that quote is, when you read it, you make these connections that maybe wasn't intention in right. it wasn't intended by the original author, right? But you make these connections and these ideas associated with it, mm -hmm. and you know uh, uh, what does it say? Poets do this. Yeah, so poets and preachers. Know poets this, and preachers. But right. Biblical critics. Uh, they and, seek to suppress and biblical it. critics, which I'm very, you know, being a historian, I'm really sympathetic to. Right. They want to be very strict with the uh, historical critical method and say it can only mean what right. the original author meant it to mean. Yeah. yeah. And of course, so this is this is a topic for a whole other time. But right. I mean, this is the whole like this is the whole postmodern movement. Like we just can't know. 
right. what an author meant to say. So they raise all sorts of problems. But of course, that pendulum swung way too far. And yeah. it, it, it's like I said, a big topic for another time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should probably uh, save that for something else. But yeah, I mean, I think this is a good, good summary of chapter one. Okay. And then um, next time we'll start uh, Rome. Yeah, see, gonna, yeah, see yeah, how Paul echoes does in Romans. Romans. Yep, yeah. Sounds good. All righty. Well, um, see you next time. See you next time. Thank you for watching TactCast, a production of the Tennessee Academy of Christian Thought. Be sure to subscribe, like, and comment. Make sure to follow us over on our social medias. Links in the description. Thanks for watching.